Anybody see the game last night, Saudi Arabia, Socceroos? Put your hand up for me if you could. Most of you, most of you. Uh, I'm guilty, I watched half of it and I walked out. Um, only because we had to get back to the hotel and then we couldn't find it on the television. Um, but I'll ask you another question. You know, years ago I had a dream to go to England and be a professional soccer player and everybody, including my parents, said you'll never do it. But it was a dream followed by an ID. I was good at science and maths. And that's why I've figured out that this is the answer to everyone's problems. And a football is a perfect object. It doesn't make mistakes. The more you use it, the less mistakes you make. And that's football. So are our kids playing with a soccer in a backyard like every single one of us did? No. So how can we expect 10, 15 years later when we're playing against the Saudis, right, that their touch is twice as good as ours? So collectively, as parents, as coaches, as teachers, as officials of the game, as uh, representatives of the government, right, do we want to be a proper football nation or not? We've got to make that decision. Then we've got to get our kids doing soccer homework in the backyards, in the villages, in the communities. So this touches onto something that, that, that's deep for me. Um, well, that's, that's what I want to touch on, Craig. With, when you look at Brazil and Argentina here tonight and, and the absolute unbelievable level of talent that's in those squads, and you can probably multiply those teams four and five times over and you get the same standard uh, of player and team. The kids in Argentina and Brazil, they grow up knowing that they can win a World Cup and knowing that they can be part of a World Cup winning team. Kids in Australia, they grow up loving the sport. There's 1.96 million, player, uh, million players registered in Australia. One in two players, one in two kids who are aged between six and 13 are actually playing the game in this country, three times more than any other sport. So we, we've got the numbers. But they don't grow up knowing that they can win a World Cup. They might dream it, but they don't know it. You've said to me many, many times that Australia can win a World Cup. Why are you so confident? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm incredibly confident because has anybody noticed that Brazilian kids have got two arms and two legs? <laughs> and so have Argentines? And so have Australian kids? Has anybody noticed that Brazilian kids play football every day? Right? And it's how they get their self-esteem in the community and they become part of, of a team. Has anybody noticed how many distractions our kids have got? And that's good on us. We have a better lifestyle. So they don't understand hunger. They don't understand frustration. They don't understand pain. Why? Because we're all responsible parents and most of us grew up on tough, mean streets and we had nothing. So we've overcompensated, so now we give them everything, right? But they haven't struggled and they haven't fought like we fought. And therefore, uh, then you've got this other problem. So hold that, Ralphie. Yeah. That's the solution. That's the solution. That's the problem. You, you know, so you've got our sophisticated digital consumers going forwards, our kids. And this, and YouTube, and gaming is the problem. So, you, you talk about yeah, a cultural disconnect. But do we give up disconnect. though, Craig? Because that's, that's just going to get more and more consuming. Do we give up? Okay, I, I just sp spoke to Kimon and uh, um, uh, three or four other ex-players. We all know the problems. The parents, we all know the problem. The coaches, you, you stick up your hand if you're a coach, please. Yeah, there's a few around. We all know the problems, right? And yes, what good is it teaching uh, uh, some players some strategy if they can't control it and, and, and can't pass it? So what we've got to do is we've got to use technology, we've got to use apps, we've got to use all of this to re-engage them. We've got to reinvent the soccer ball and make it much more inclusive, accessible, rewarding, 
challenging, and we can by using the assets that we have at our disposal. Now, now it's funny, we all know the problems, but the answers lie in where I've just said. And if anyone's interested, uh, this is my legacy. Uh, Ralph knows nobody else. I've been really sick. You say it quickly. You say it quickly. Quickly. Yeah, Craig's gone uh, through some health, serious health issues over the last couple of years. Um, he's a guy that doesn't need to, you know, spend time on other things other than his health at the moment. Uh, That's it. That's it. Thank you, Ralph. Anyway, I've, uh, I've been really sick and I had a, a bunch of uh, operations and uh, radiation and stuff. Too close to my uh, brain stem, actually, which wasn't big to start with, and now it's even smaller. Um, so the word comes up, legacy, and I spoke to Kimon about this. Um, what was the point of my journey and my struggles and my, my pain and grief in the Middlesbrough car park to learn how to get better if I can't pass that on to the kids of Australia so that they can understand... Thank you, thank you. Um, so that, you know, we all have a problem now and, and what it is, if this becomes less fun, then kids will drop out of the game eventually. And it's not just Australia that has this problem. Look, look at England getting beat by Iceland in the European Championship. The problems everywhere is our kids no longer love the concept of playing with a soccer ball and coaching process has been over-intellectualized. It's become boring for kids. So we're losing our kids. Now, again, I, I feel like I know everybody in this room. And that's because you're all players or you're all involved and you all love it like I do, right? And, and if you love it and you've played soccer, you understand the values of teamwork, of winning together, of losing together, of, of getting punched in the face. And what did you used to do? used to go and punch him back in the face, and then afterwards, you'd shake hands and you remembered you became good friends. Now, you go and watch a video and you, you do all sorts of, because you don't know how to behave. And team sport, if there's a jerk in the team or the room, the team sorts him out. The community sorts him out. And we're losing so many players and these values that about how to behave that only team sport can deliver. So my legacy, right, is to use the power of soccer and other team sport to get kids back into team sport and get them interacting with each other and reverse these dreadful trends where kids are now becoming individuals and isolated and getting the wrong messages. And, and what I always say is we, we've got a a soccer tournament up in Lake Macquarie, where I'm from. It's called Craig Johnston Cup. And what you do is you s each high school splits the team in half, then they play against each other in a skills competition, ending with six aside. So you get a winning team, losing team, but the team spirit is back. So back in my days, just to finish, Ralph, there was black and white. Team spirit, there was right and wrong. There was no grey areas. Now, there's so much grey and so many bad messages for our kid. You don't even know who the bad guys are or the bad messages are. So what we've got to do is get the kids back into the joys of team spirit, the camaraderie. Somebody said it tonight, the goalkeeper. Goalkeeper. What's your name again, mate? Jeff Olver. Jeff Olver. Jeff mentioned the word, he said the brotherhood. And I said, yeah, the brotherhood. I caught up with Ian Rush not so long ago. I hadn't seen Rushy for 20 years. He's still, till, still telling the same jokes. Still not funny. Um, and he's tell, talking about his, his goals. The point being, we're all a brotherhood, even the girls, we're all a brotherhood. And this is what bonds us and unites us. This is through this team sport and team spirit, we can teach our kids how they need to behave. 
or they teach each other, right? And uh, that's my legacy. And furthermore than that, this dream I had to go to England and be a professional soccer player, and everybody laughed. I, I still can't believe I went and I did it. But I'm going to say something to you that, that'll shock you, okay? Is with all my heart, I, Craig Johnston, fully believe that Australia could win the World Cup of soccer. <laughs> I do, and I tell you why I do. Because in 20 years' time, either Brazil or Argentina or Germany is going to win the World Cup. And you know those 11 players on the field? They've got two arms and they've got two legs. And they will have had 20 years of touching their ball with the, foot, the ball with the feet and figuring out what foot, what part of foot on what part of ball to what effect. And you'll see that tonight. So, I look at Saudi Arabia last night and I see the difference in skill. But in 20 years, if we've got kids every day going out in their backyard, in their schoolyards, really important. The biggest, I believe, the biggest single thing that, that the government can help us all with is get more kids playing more school, soccer in more school, by breaking down the skills and providing a better range of facilities, then getting soccer's organising bodies to help with them. So, again, sorry, Ralph, I haven't let you speak, mate. Um, it, I want to thank you for the easiest interview I've ever done in 25 years of radio. Uh, mate, I can go on. I can go on forever, Craig. You have been a true inspiration, and I've interviewed so many uh, of the golden generation over the years, and they talk about their inspiration, and you were that inspiration. So, your journey to Liverpool all those years ago, being told that you weren't good enough, all the battles in the car park at Middlesbrough and all the other things that you had to go through, this is, this is what it's led to, mate. The love for the room and in many hundreds of uh, careers in full-time football. But I want to thank you for being part of this today. Uh, people obviously uh, have got such a, a buzz from hearing you talk today. And the fact that you believe Australia can win the World Cup one day, well, that's just absolutely inspirational to the rest of us. Well, th th thank you, Ralph. And um, again, you don't see me because I'm sick of telling my story and I always get emotional, I always b b burst into tears, I always feel like a jerk, <laughs> right? Um, but I'm a really practical person, so the reason I've come out of hiding is I'm sick of talking about it. And where it will get done is in places like this, with clever people like you. You've all done well in life. You all love the game. You've all got kids. You've all got a school. You've all got a say in government and parliament. You're all coaches, you know? So we can start together to make a difference. And I think about eight years ago, I heard a statistic. And it was this simple. And this is why Australia can win the World Cup. That per capita, and the Olympics was all the rage, there's more world champions per capita in this country than any other country in the world. Russia, China, USA, throw them all in. So think about that. Now, we focus them on this and give them the soccer homework that they do on a daily basis, and it's got to be fun. You've got to involve apps and electronics and giant playstations where they t turn buzzers and lights and bells and whistles on with their feet and their head, right? And there's some clever stuff because there's some clever electronics people in Australia. And we can make that equipment that makes players come back to it every day because we've got to speak to these kids in their language. They're all gamers, right? They're all YouTube aficionados. They're cleverer than us at the digital stuff. So speak to them in language, engage them, reward them, challenge them. And um, you know what? Uh, I'd love to come back down to Melbourne and, uh, and work with you if anybody's up for it. Thanks very much, Craig. Ladies and gentlemen, Craig Johnston, legend of Australian football. Thank you.
Stan. Craig, well done.